here today. Thank you for taking the time. I know that there's loads of different options around for where to invest your energy, so I appreciate you being here. Um, I'm here with Bronte, that's how I see you, that's right, yeah, who's um, amazingly volunteered to be in the hot seat today. And um, what we're going to talk about is a little bit of a generalised approach to how it is that you can go about managing your emotions and mastering your mindset and kind of getting your head in the right space to do what you want to do with your writing. And then Bronte is going to share her story or a little bit of her story about where she's currently at and, um, and where it is that she wants to go and we'll kind of pin back and forth between each other. Um, but the thing that really I find the most valuable and I think everyone else finds the most valuable and I know it can be kind of a weird thing to do in these settings but if you have any questions or like you don't understand something or you have a situation which is current for you which you'd like some feedback on that relates to what we're saying then totally let me know because um, that's kind of what I'm here for and uh, it would be really great to bring everything to life because the principles that I talk about uh, they're not just theory you kind of have to actively be involved in the processes and really take charge of what it is that you're thinking in order for them to be effective. Um, that's probably the biggest realisation I've had as a person and as a coach through personal experience in that you have to be actively doing, you have to be actively involved in the thought processes that you want to be involved in to create a certain result and I'm going to explain a little bit more what I mean about that. Your emotional state at any one time, so how it is you're feeling, is a combination of three main components, a combination of three main factors. They are your focus, your self-talk or your internal dialogue, and your physiology. So those three components, although it's a simplistic way of looking at it, arms you with, in with information. Because basically, you can think of that as a formula. It's like one plus one plus one equals three. So this morning I did a, a talk with Warwick Schiller on anxiety and let's pretend that anxiety has a, uh, uh, what do you call it, an allocation, that's not the right word, I can't think of the word, of three. And so your focus would have to equal one, your self-talk would have to equal one, and the way you're using your body or your physiology would have to equal one in order for anxiety to exist. Does that make sense? So just as anxiety has its own score, that's the word I was looking for, score, Confidence also has its own score, or frustration has its own score, or being relaxed has its own score. And the score comes from how you're managing those three areas. So in order to feel fearful or in order to feel relaxed, you have to be actively directing your focus in a specific direction. Anxiety in and of itself needs to be future focused and it needs to be you focusing on something going wrong. You need to be focused on the worst case scenario. So to bring that little model to life, I need to be focusing on me going out and jumping my horse and me falling off, or my horse spooking and me being not sure how to manage it. That's where my focus goes. In response to that, my self-talk comes to the party and I say to myself, I really don't want that to happen. Or what if he spooks and I can't manage it and that person over there sees and I fall off and then when I fall off, my horse runs off and they can't catch him and he potentially hurts himself. And then what if they can't load him on the float and I need to go to this place and you can see where it goes with this. It creates, we create a narrative in our mind. And in response to that narrative, we feel a certain way. Now, the reason we feel a certain way is because unconsciously, our unconscious mind can't tell the difference between what's real and imagined. That's why if you sit here right now and you think about a future event which causes you to feel concerned, it's because you have actually clocked unconsciously that that's happening right now. Your unconscious mind has no concern whether it happened in the past or whether it potentially might happen in the future. It is present focused. So if you think about it, you feel it now, even if you're far removed from the situation. So when it comes to creating a different experience or a different reality, we actually have to be able to develop the capacity to be creationary as opposed to reactionary. And for the most part, we're in the position where we're reacting to everything that is coming at us without being able to cultivate a degree of mindfulness where we sit back and we say, what is it that we want? And we're also dragging the past forward. So we cultivate an identity around past behavior for ourselves and for our horses. So that when we wake up in the morning, 
We have a degree of certainty about what to expect. We love certainty. We love to know what's going to happen, even if it's not currently serving us. So we get addicted to how it is that we're used to feeling. If we're anxious and we've been anxious for a period of time and we've practiced being anxious, we get addicted to being anxious. And I'll give you an, an, an example of what I mean. I often work with competition riders and they go through a process where all of a sudden they get to a competition and they don't feel nervous. And then they realize that they don't feel nervous and they get nervous about the fact they don't feel nervous anymore. And that feels wrong. Like something's gonna happen, it's really weird to not feel nervous about this. Why, why am I not feeling nervous? That means I'm not aware of something or something's gonna happen that I'm not paying attention to. And it's because they've got used to or addicted to the feeling of feeling anxious. Are you following on? So when we have a thought, we create a feeling. And that feeling is a result of a series of biochemical reactions happening in our body. Now when those biochemical reactions happen over a period of time, it's like you getting a shot of something. And you become used to functioning with a certain amount of shots of the same emotion. And so when you don't feel that shot, it's like you seek it out. You kind of seek that emotion out. And that's where we become what I call emotionally addicted to certain things. You know, you kind of get into the drama of it, you're addicted to feeling anxious or you're addicted to feeling a bit fearful. And I'm not saying this is conscious. This is unconsciously. This is unconsciously how we're working. But this is why we slip into the patterns of feeling like a feeling is a part of us as opposed to a behaviour. It's like I'm an anxious person or I'm an anxious rider as opposed to being the opposite. And I'm using anxiety as an example. It can be a lot of different things. And it could also be positively geared as well. So... We have a situation now with Bronte. Um, perhaps it's better if you explain where you're at. So tell us where you've, um, what you've been doing and what you love and then what created the, the change that made you want to have a chat today and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, you kind of have to talk into it like you're about to kiss it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so about a year ago, I was really happy just jumping and competing and having a blast. I was confident and I was having so much fun. And then we had a series, almost like bad luck. We got a pony who got really badly grass affected and I got fucked off a couple of times. So we decided to sell him on and we got another pony who was given to us quite in bad condition. And she had ulcers and selen she was selenium deficient and so she started bucking and I got backed off a lot and I kind of, my fear just kind of built up like over time and it just, until I just couldn't get on her anymore. So we've had to send her to someone else to get sold on. But now when I try and ride the pony that I've got now, all I can think about is just like cantering, she's gonna buck, I can't get on her because I'm scared that she's going to bolt away and butt because that's how it's all happened at the start. So I want to be able to ride through that and reach my goals and not be living in fear of my riding. That's amazing. You're so articulate. Thank you. Um, so before I take it back, what is it you, you want to be... Like, not living in fear is kind of like not what, wanting... To... Not living in fear is a negatively geared goal. So I want you to think of it this way. I want you to not think about a blue tree. I don't want you to think about a blue tree and I don't want you to think about the little yellow bird that's sitting on top of the blue tree. And I don't want you to think of the green grass underneath the blue tree. Do not think about any of those things, okay? So when I ask you to not think about it, you think about it, right? Because we can only ever move towards something. We can't move away from something. In order for you to not think about a blue tree, you have to think about an orange tree. Yeah, and if you've been with me, you've heard this example a few times, but it's really important. So not wanting to ride in fear makes you think about riding in fear. You can't not ride in fear, you can only ride with more relax and calm. Do you know what I mean? So the very first thing you have to do is make sure that your goals are positively geared. The directives that you're giving your mind are positively geared. Because not being afraid and being calm and relaxed in the saddle give you two completely different feelings, yeah? Gives you a completely different mental movie that you conjure up for yourself. And actually this one thing is the biggest, 
the simplest and most difficult thing to get your head around in practice. It's like if you can allow yourself to let what you don't want illuminate what you do want and get into that practice of using it as a springboard all the time, then you're automatically training your focus in the direction that you want. It's like a muscle that we need to work. Yeah. So Bronte's experience is one that I hear about all the time. It's not that you're not amazing and special, it's just like a common situation where we've had an injury and um, we've had an accident that has a strong emotional charge. And we are always working for our positive benefit mentally. It may not appear that way, but all behaviour that we engage in has a positive ramification for us, even if it might not seem completely obvious. And we always need to understand that the reason that you feel afraid is because you don't want to get hurt again. And that's a completely legitimate response. And in the, in, straight off the bat, we need to ascertain, I'm always asking, well, is the fear valid? Like, is this still a valid fear that we have here? Like, if you get back on, are you going to get bucked off? I want to know that. Like, is that actually something that we need to pay attention to? Because as part of the strategy, and I know that you've worked on the horse, I'm not saying this applies to you, but part of the strategy that Bronte and her mum have done is they've already done the work with the horse, yeah? They've already put a plan in place to make sure that they're happy and calm, and so that's a situation that I'm comfortable saying, okay, now we have the mindset element to deal with. Because if that wasn't dealt with, then I'm like, well, I'm not going to say, come on, Bronte, let's get it together and do all this stuff, and then you're going to get on a horse that bucks. I'd be afraid too. I don't want to get on a horse that's got stuff going on. So that's a really important component of the strategy, making sure that the fear isn't valid. And if the fear isn't valid, in terms of, I know that actually when I get on this horse, the main concern is in my mind, then we have a plan that we can work on with the mindset. It doesn't mean that the other side of things needs to be discounted. It just means that, oh, it's, sorry, that it's the end of the road. It's just that that's something that needs to be paid attention to. So there's two different elements when it comes to putting a plan in place. There's the unconscious side of things. And if you think of the unconscious mind as like the lake, and the conscious mind is like you in the canoe on top of the lake. So we try to do a lot of things consciously. We try to like, like I'm sure you're sitting in the saddle and you know this is not reasonable. You know what I mean? And you just wish it was different. But if you're in that situation of like wishing it was different and you say to yourself, I know I should be able to do this, but it's an unconscious driver. It's like the little protective mechanism in your mind going, you're not safe, we're not going to let you do that, you're not going to understand why, but we're just going to send you all the physical responses that tell you you should just freeze up and get out of here. You know, that's the feeling that we kind of have in response to that. Is that sort of how you would describe being, yeah. So there's a two-pronged approach. I never say that there's one thing that you need to do that's like the cure-all. There's never a cure-all in my response, in my opinion. There's things that really help, and you do those unconsciously, like uh, there's lots of things we could do in a setting not like this that's like NLP techniques or hypnotherapy techniques or other techniques which are very specific to Bronte's situation. But I would never say that if we don't actually get some skills retraining how she's thinking about things and how she's directing her focus and a strategy for now incrementally increasing her comfort zone at the same time, that's a really important piece as well. So these are the two elements that we want to address. We want to undress, address, undress, kind of undress, these uh, unconscious drivers and we want to have a look at the way that you're thinking about things and perhaps the support mechanisms in place at the same time. So are you still happy sitting up here? Do you want to stay with me? Yeah, okay, don't be afraid. Um, <laughs> So, um, unconsciously, let's have a look what's happening. Saying that, or the basis that I'm going to work on is actually it's all well and good to go, oh, one-on-one -on -one we could do this, but let's have a look at today what we could actually do in a setting where you could take it away and applying it, apply it without having to work directly with someone like me. So, visualisation is basically your biggest superpower when it comes to creating a situation that is separate from one that you've currently experienced. So what we do in situations where we've been injured or had a really bad, a bad and big event happen is we use that and we keep looking at that and we take it forward with us as like a predictor of how things are going to be. So we use it to inform a situation that hasn't actually happened and we all do this. So if you imagine that to your left is the past, 
and in front of you is a big pile of stuff which represents your present moment, and to the right is your future. Really, everything that you're experiencing right now is just the past catching up with you. It's a result of all the decisions that you've made, the condition processes that you've been through, the actions that you've involved yourselves in, and now you're looking at this stuff in front of you. It's kind of like a catch-up point. And you're saying, this is where I'm at. But it doesn't mean that's where you're going to be unless you take it and you kind of kick it around and you get some on your shoe and you walk forward with it in the same way. Yeah, but the way to create the distance is actually to say, I can react to all of that. So I can react to the accident and I can see the accident and I know I don't want that to happen again and I'm gonna do my best to make that not happen again. And you inadvertently think that being concerned about it is your best way to make that not happen again. Not consciously, but unconsciously. So the more I'm worried about it, the more I freeze up, the more I try to prevent it, the, more, the less likely it is to happen. Yeah, that's like the falsity that we buy into. When actually, we need to step back and say, I get that that's how I feel, but that's how I felt in response to a situation that happened in the past. It doesn't mean that's how I'm gonna feel moving forward. And the way that we've created that feeling or strengthened that feeling is, chances are you got bucked off in real life twice, yeah? But how many times have you thought about it? A lot, like thousands of times. Like, you know, you think about it, you think about it, you relive it, you think about how it could be different, you talk about it, you think about it, you talk about it some more. And so, unconsciously, you've lived that event thousands, maybe more times. And so, your unconscious mind has actually decided that in real life, that's what's happened. And you've strengthened that neural network, yeah? So if you think about, um, you've got a wooden table in front of you, you're sitting at a wooden table, and every time you think a thought, you scratch a groove in the table. So that's one thought. So getting back off happened once, and it happened twice. That's two grooves. But every time we think about it, we have another thought. We create, keep scratching on the table, we create a deeper groove. And then when it comes to writing, that's the strongest association now you have with writing, because that's the strongest thought process you've cultivated right now in response to writing. Does that make sense? So when you go to think about writing, it's like you've dropped a marble on the table and all it does is it, search for the, it searches for the deepest groove. It doesn't matter if you've, you know, what the groove is and it could be one that is really beneficial. But if it's not, it's just taking you from A to B. You, the marble rolls down the groove and you think about that thought process again. It's, it's like a muscle. They say that neurons that fire together wire together. The more you think about something, the stronger that thought process becomes, the more real it feels. And so when you go to ride your horse, that is the strongest thought reference that you have. So I talked about with Warwick before, he talks about rabbits, and I'm going to talk about rabbits with you because it's a really good analogy, and he uses it with horses. But basically, someone at one of his clinics said, oh, my horse is crazy. Like, it just went bonkers on a ride. He's like, what happened? And it was like, well, we were riding along and one rabbit jumped out and nothing really, it was fine. And then we were riding along getting another rabbit come out. And then we kept riding and we saw 12 rabbits along the ride and nothing really happened. And then the 13th rabbit popped out and my horse exploded. And I'm like, dude, you've already seen 12 rabbits and it was fine, now you see the 13th rabbit and it, it goes, you go out of your mind. And he's like, well, your, your rabbit has a 12, rab your horse has a 12 rabbit limit. Meaning that every time you saw the rabbit, a little bit of anxiety came into the system and it wasn't released. And the second rabbit, a little bit more. And by the 13th rabbit, it was boom. Couldn't handle the amount of anxiety that had built up in the system without dissipation. So we just have a lot of rabbits right now. Because every time you've thought about the event, it's created a, a little bit of a feeling inside you. Yeah, you hold on to a little bit of tension. So you might be just at home, like maybe about to sit down on the couch and someone goes, Bronte, are you gonna go riding on the weekend? And you think, yeah but you have that feeling of tightness and you hold on to it and there's no release. And so that happens a few more times, a few more times until you build up and you're in a situation where the environment isn't pressurizing you as well. And then all of a sudden you get to your horse and it's like, Phew! that feeling of like, it's just too much, I can't do it. You know, because over the week, the, the subtle accumulation of tension with the thoughts has resulted in a build up, a build up, a build up, a build up, a build up. And then you get to the situation and it's like it's too much. Does that, is that sort of what, does that make sense to you in terms of what happens? Yeah. So 
can you see that the actual retraining of the injury process happens well away? It happens with the thought. And you need to actually get to the stage where you feel that experience of tension. And it's not about a denial of what's happened. It's just about, I'm going to work with that until the tension dissipates. And then I'm going to keep going. So you don't have, you have a peak and you have a release. You have a peak and you have a release. So we're going to talk about ways of doing that. But the visualisation process is really important. So do you have a favourite fruit? What is it? A watermelon. It's a great example. I haven't used a watermelon this weekend. So, huge and heavy, but imagine there's a watermelon sitting on my hand. Massive, actually. Quite hard. My left hand, too. It's not my dominant hand. Um, so, in front of you is a huge watermelon, and you know when you crack that watermelon open, sitting on my hand right now, it's going to be that amazing ready pink colour. And it's just the most perfect watermelon. It's just been picked. It's quite heavy, but you know it's really juicy and it tastes like summer and it's amazing. And so we're going to split it open now. So I'm actually holding two halves. I'm that talented. And there's a little bit of juice that's gone down onto my hand. It's actually dripping onto the floor now. And you can probably taste and smell that watermelony smell that's like, yeah, I really dig that watermelon. It's amazing. It's going to be great. And it looks fresh and it looks perfect. And I'm going to cut it up and I'm going to give you a piece of watermelon and you're going to taste it and it's going to be that explosion in your mouth where it kind of almost dissolves because it's a really nice watermelon, but it's just enough to give you a satisfied feeling and then you swallow it and you're like, I want me some more of that. Yeah, right, how do we go? So, chances are you can actually see the watermelon, you can smell the watermelon, you could taste the watermelon, you might even have some saliva in your mouth where your body's got ready to eat the watermelon. And for all intents and purposes, even though consciously you're like, clearly there is no watermelon, you've got ready to eat the watermelon. You're actually thinking about it now, wondering whether you like watermelon, whether you don't like watermelon, when they come into season, whether they'll be that expensive this year. So this is the language of the unconscious mind. We talk via the sensory system, yeah? And the reason that your conscious mind prepared your body was because it doesn't know or care whether it's real or not. You could consciously override it, but still you'll get the saliva, you can smell it, you can taste it. And this is what we do with the injury situation. You know, we think about an accident, we have a mental movie that comes up in response to that accident, we see it happening, we know how we feel, we create an internal dialogue in response to it, and all of a sudden, we feel the feelings as if that was happening right now. Because it's the watermelon effect. Your body doesn't know whether it's real or imagined. As long as you give it enough information, it, that's how it comes into effect, yeah? And so, even though you've only fallen off twice, you've fallen off thousands of times according to your unconscious mind. And so a huge alarm bell goes off when you go to your horse. It's like, bah, 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 you know, danger, danger. This is what we're going to get hurt here. So you're doing exactly the right thing. You're responding in the way you're just training yourself to respond. We all do this, yeah? So now with that knowledge, you can go, okay, what is it that I want to experience? This is the first part of the step. I want to get on my horse and at the moment, if I could see a three-month goal, what would a good three-month goal be? Like realistically, what would be a good three-month goal? Um, I'm not sure. So, so let's have a think about what would, from where you're sitting right now, if you were to say, in three months' time, if I could do that, I'd be so happy. So it might be, you know what, in three months' time, if I could get on my horse and canter around and feel good about it, I'd be stoked with that. Or it might be, in three months' time, if I could just get on and ride off down the driveway, that would make me feel happy. It doesn't have to be competitive. It's just like, what would make you feel happy? And also be a differential in feeling between what it is you experience now and, and what it is you want to experience. To go out into an open paddock yeah. and just feel really confident cantering. Yeah. Really open. Cool. Alright, so that's our template. Yeah, that's what we're moving towards. And so in order for that to happen in our experience, we have to be comfortable with the thought of that happening. That's the very first thing that has to happen. So that's the first information. We have to be comfortable with the thought. And we know watermelon effect. Our unconscious mind needs to be fed in senses. So you're going to create a picture, and I'm going to, what colour is your horse? He's done. Done. Oh, 
How big is she? Fourteen two. There we go. What's she called? Magic. Magic. Oh, it's a dream picture for me. Right. So, Bronte, you're on Magic right now. Beautiful done pony. It's summer, so her coat is looking incredible. And I want you to imagine that you are actually in the riding position. You're not seeing yourself riding. You are riding. So if we were sitting here right now and you're in the saddle, what would you see? You'd see your horse's neck. Yeah. You'd see her ears, and they're kind of attentive. You know, they're like they're flicking back and forth so that you know she's with you. And you've got your hands, and they feel really relaxed. And you look down, and it's really lush paddock, and you realise that you're outside. And when you look up, there's just all the scene that you would see around you in the paddock that you're a part of, yeah? So you're out there and it's warm. Let's pretend it's warm. It's kind of a nice sunny day, perfect breeze, not too much, just enough, right? And then we're feeling good. Your horse, you've actually just been cantering around. And so her neck's just that nice sheen of like having a little bit of sweat, but not too much. And you can hear her breath just, and you can hear her footprints just on the ground. You know, it feels really good. And, you're thinking to yourself, wow, this feels amazing. I feel so relaxed and she's so with me and things are so good and, you know, we've really got it going on together and I, this is a really good day. This is how I feel. And your mum goes, how are you going, Bronte? And you're like, it's amazing, mum, just leave us out here for five more minutes. And that sort of situation, yeah. So we don't want to be like, I want you to visualise. And you're like, got nothing. You know, because visualisation can seem really boring. But visualisation is, is so exciting. It's like that place. It's you creating a narrative of what you want to step into. So basically, if you can think that every thought you have moving forward is an invitation for what you want to experience. So every time you think of bucking, you're inviting that into your reality. Every time you think of it going well, you're inviting that into your reality. So it becomes like a choice. It's like I've laid out in front of you five different possibilities for how it's going to be moving forward. You've got the bucking, you've got this amazing situation with you out there with magic in the paddock and, you know, and there's you at the competition and there's you, and you can choose a few of them, but every time you think it, you're one step closer towards it. So you have to actually get into the situation where you're choosing what it is that you think, and it will feel quite difficult in the beginning because you've just got good at thinking the wrong thing and the other thing that happens is that we create another false idea that in order for us to prevent something happening, it's unsafe for us to think of good things happening. You know what I mean? Like it, if you've had a bit of a bad run, and for some of us when I say this, they're like, oh, it feels like I've got a voice in my head that goes, whatever, that's not going to happen, or it just doesn't feel like I can ever get into that space. You actually have to divorce yourself and realise that that past stuff doesn't mean that that's how it's going to be moving forward. And you have to give yourself the gift of imagining. But pretending that like it's a step closer towards that card that's lying on the table. Do you think you can do that? Yeah. So every time you have a thought that comes up that isn't what you want to think, and you want to take a step back from that card and a step towards the other one, Right now, I want you to pretend in your mind you've got a big red button and it says delete on it. And do you use a computer much? What sort of computer do you have? Um, just a laptop. A is that a Mac or an... Uh, no, I won't judge you. It's okay. A HP. Okay. <laughs> so when you make a track, when you check, uh, move something into the trash, does it go... Does it make that little sound? Mm. No. Mm. Okay, we're going to have to come up with something different. So let's pretend... What's a, have you got like one of those garbage um, incinerators? Oh, have you ever used an incinerator? Come to think of it. You, you know if you crushed something, like you put something through the garbage and it's like Or like ever seen one of those massive logging machines where they put a log through and it's like And it like just tunes everything out, yeah. So you are going to invent like the world's best thought masher in your mind. And whatever that looks like, it might be like, I, I don't have an incinerator at home, but I've stayed in hotels where they have them and it's like one of the best times of your life. So you put like raw vegetables in there, that are the ends of it obviously, you don't put good food in there. And then you turn it on and it's like, and you think, oh my God, what's happening? And you open it up and it's gone. And you're like, where did it go? It's like, that's incredible. That's what you're gonna do with those thoughts. So it's like you press delete, your little mental incinerator comes on in your mind. If you want, to, you don't have to tell anyone this is happening. That's the joy of it. 
You can be like, and, you're like, and then you're going to think about what's one step closer towards what it is that I want. You don't have to go into great detail so that you're like checking out of life for 15 minutes and being like, oh, there I am, I'm in the paddock and I can see my horse in front of me. But you just have to have the vision. So you get into the habit of, no, I don't want you, I delete you and I step towards the next goal, yeah? Okay, so that's what we do unconsciously. That's part of the unconscious process. In order for you to actually move through it, we also need to recognise that Everything that happens to us is fluid, yeah? And what we do is when we get trapped in the feeling of an event, we've created a stuckness in our body. We haven't let it move through us. You know, it's kind of like we're holding on to it. And so what I want you to think about is instead of that event defining you, because there's a panic often that rises up when we experience something going wrong that makes us think that we're always going to be like this. It's never going to be any different and we're the only one, yeah? It's sort of like it makes you, it feels stuck. So I want you to think, this is the process. You're going to have the thought of what you don't want. You're going to know it's not what you don't want. What are you going to do at that point? You're going to press the, tell me. What are you pressing? The red button. The, the red button. She's getting it. She's, you're awesome. The delete button and it's going to, what sound? Do you want to do the sound? Shall I do the sound for you? I can do this. I'm going, like I say, you're like you're shredding that 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 thought, and then you're stepping towards what it is you want. Yeah, you're thinking about what it is that you want, and now the next thing you're going to do is you're going to just remind yourself that that old feeling is just moving through. Yeah, and this is the way that you're going to do it. So I want you to pretend that at the base of your tummy, about four fingers below your belly button, is your seat. It's like your centre of balance. And when you feel good, that's where your breath comes from, yeah? That's where your energy sits. We're really centralised when we're in that place. And when you feel upset or anxious or afraid, your centre shifts and it might, be, it might be in your chest or it might be in your solar plexus or it might be in your tummy. You know, depending on the emotional upset, it tends to float up and down our body. So if you can pretend that from that place, there is a, a channel, like a, a channel that a ping pong ball could move up and down. And it goes from four fingers below your belly button to just below the base of your throat. And when you feel good, that's where the ball or the ball of light or the ping pong ball or whatever you want to visualise sits in that place, yeah? And when you feel uptight or when you think about that thought, it's going to change places. So it might go, it might go to here or it might go to here. And I want you to visualise in your mind that the ball is sitting in the place that the emotion sits, yeah? So the way that you can change this is you need to have a game with yourself where your aim is to get that ball back into your centre. And the way that you do that is breathing out. So you're going to focus on your out breath. You might breathe in for a few breaths and then out for like, so maybe your breath count is like four counts in and you might pretend that it's, or you might practice eight counts out so you're really emphasising your exhale. And you're going to stay with it until you feel the ball either drop down to a place where you feel happier or go back to your centre, yeah? And you're going to practice that exercise just in day-to-day -day life. So not to do with the horses, but when you think about the thought of riding, if you notice that you have a shift in the energy, you're going to practice getting the ball back to that point. And then the very first thing that we're going to do when we get to the stage of you getting back on is you're going to sit there on the horse and you're going to do that same exercise. So you're going to notice, you're not going to walk off, you're just going to stand there, you can have your mum hold the horse if you want, whatever you want to make you feel comfortable. And you're going to stand there and you're just going to practice dropping the ball back to your centre and then you might get off and call it a day. So your whole regulation practice comes with, actually, how am I going to get myself back to centre? And it will start in places where the pressure comes on a little bit and the pressure can just come from the thought. It doesn't mean that anything's changed around you. And then you'll get so good at that, that when the environment, which means the horse situation or something is a little bit more under the pump, you can still do that, yeah? So it gives you like a tool to work with. Does that make sense? Does that make sense for everyone else? Yeah. Because thoughts and feelings, they can feel so intangible. It's like it's out there, I don't know how to like change this around. So if you can give yourself ways of actually visualising what that might look like and then changing it in some way that changes the representation for you, then that's really, really important. So when it comes to getting back in the saddle, 
if we think about some of the conscious processes, what at the moment represents your comfort zone? Like, what are you super comfortable doing? Like, no questions asked. It might be just leading them on the ground. It might be saddling up. It might be everything before riding. Like, what, what represents your comfort zone right now? Um, probably just walking around. On the set? Yeah, on, yeah. So, what we want to do is get to the stage where we can understand the comfort zone and then understand what represents just one step outside the comfort zone. What's like elasticizing the edge of that very slightly? And so it might be in the beginning, a bigger walk or like a walk towards trot. It doesn't have to be trot. So what we want to do is we want to do that until you feel that you're actually just outside your comfort zone and then you're going to come back to walk. And you're going to stay and walk until you get the ball back down into your centre. Now on the first day, it might be you do that once and you've ridden for 45 minutes and that's what it's taken to actually incrementally increase the comfort zone, drop it back and find our baseline again. But if you do that two days, three days in a row, you'll find it gets boring and you've noticed that your comfort zone has just stretched out that little bit and all of a sudden you'll want to trot. And you trot until you feel again, trot, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm not okay, stop, get the ball back into the centre, keep working with the breath, either call it a day or you might find after five minutes you feel fine and you can do it again. So we go in the peaks and troughs. We're working with that same principle of like, because generally what happens is we get on, we have an expectation, there's been an event, we've been thinking about it prior, which has like built up our comfort zone to an unreasonable level, you know, a discomfort zone to an unreasonable level. Already we're super uncomfortable as soon as we've got on the horse. And then we do something like, we need to trot, we trot, 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 and then we're like, oh, we're in that place where it's just too much. Make sense? And so what you want to do is go, it's a little bit too much and now I'm relaxed. And it's a little bit too much and now I'm relaxed. We don't want to go to the abort zone. And that's the survival zone. Because as soon as you get there, no good can come out of it. Now, in the beginning, you have to suspend all of the shoulds because you've been in a really accomplished place and it feels like you should be in a different place to this. Like, this feels ridiculous. But this is temporary. It's super temporary. And what you'll find is if you just give yourself the gift of time, for it, it can, it, this can change in like a week or two weeks or it might take two months. But if you stick in there, you'll be back to the place you were so fast compared to if you pretend it's not happening and then you're probably going to stay at ground zero for, you know, just because nothing's changed, that's all. So you have to actually be really kind to yourself in this period and realise that this isn't like a predictor of how it's going to be in the future. This is just you retraining the thought processes because you experienced something which was really, you know, emotionally charged and valid. So you, it's okay that you feel this way. So there's a trust relationship that has to be really built up. You have to be able to trust your horse again. And there has to be a congruency between the thought and the feeling. Not like me or your mum or someone else saying, it's going to be okay, because the back of your conscious mind goes, no, it's not. You don't understand. You don't know me. You know, like that's how we could boxercise out the good thoughts. So what we're looking for is that alignment between thought and feeling. So that's the first thing, you get on, you practice with the ball. The second thing is, you don't always know what the directions are gonna be. Like you don't always know what the aids are or what's necessary, because you're always wanting to be responsive to your horse. So questions are the best way to get around this, yeah? The three questions that I use are, are you with me? Where are we going? Am I soft? So when you're riding around at a walk, you'd be like, are you with me? And if your horse is like, oh, what's that over there? You'd be like, hey, magic, come back. Like, let's do a little bit of this. Let's get you a bit soft. Let's bend around. And so your mind goes to, what do I need to do with you to help you be relaxed? Not, are you going to buck? Because that's like the watermelon thing. The are you going to buck makes you think about bucking, which makes you reactive to the bucking, which makes your horse think, why is she reacting to the thing that's over there? What should I be looking at? And then it's like, down grab a holy go. So are you with me? Where are we heading means that you're purposeful. So instead of being like, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, like I'm heading to the chair and now I'm heading to the desk and now I'm heading to the wall and are you with me? And that's where we're heading. So there's like purpose to your, it's not like I have to do a whole lap of the arena and survive. It's like, I need to get to the chair and now I need to get to the projector and now I need to get to the desk. It's like, we're breaking it down into chunks. And then am I soft is like your directive. So you're like, are you with me? 
Okay, they actually need to soften down. So there's a thing, there's the, the unconscious programming, so the working with the ball, thinking about what it is that you want to accomplish, um, giving yourself the time to actually increase your comfort zone, and then the directive. So you're in, when you're in the saddle, this is where you actually focus your attention on what you want. Does that make sense? Yeah. Helpful? Yeah. Okay. How are we going? All right? You're all with me? I get excited, so I'm like, ooh, ooh. But let's tell them everything we know from the last 20 years. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, one other thing that um, you mentioned, which I don't know if whether it's um, relevant or you want to talk about it, is the concern about what other people think. Is that, should we talk about that now? Because I know that's sort of like quite a thing for a lot of people. And the funny thing is, this might liberate a lot of you. <laughs> I hear from 95% of people that they are concerned about what other people think. And I think if you're all concerned about what other people think and the other people are concerned about what you think, nobody's actually thinking about you because they're all too, too concerned about what you're thinking about them. Do you know what I mean? It's like the cruel irony. <laughs> so while you're worrying about me, I'm worrying about you <laughs> thinking about me. So the thing to realise in any situation is that you always have to work within what is within your control and what is within your influence. And if you are worried about things which are outside of your control and influence, you're essentially directing your energy to a fruitless occupation. There is nothing you can do to change that. The only thing you can do is actually direct it to what it is that you want to produce. So at any point in time, you can ask yourself, can I control this? Can I influence it? No, you can't. The other thing is, it actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what other people are thinking. You can't actually please everyone. I had someone come up yesterday and go, I really loved your seminar, but my friends decided that they, you went for them. And I'm like, well, that's great. I'm not for everyone. You know, I don't want to be for everyone because you have to stand for something. And when you stand for something and you're writing for yourself, you have to decide, am I going to project my truth or am I going to write for what, I, what they want me to be? And when you do that, A, you're never accurate because you never actually know and you de-anchor yourself, you get outside yourself. So you don't want everyone to like you. You don't want everyone to approve. You don't need their approval because they're not in charge of what you need to produce. You're not in charge of them. You know, they can do what they want, but you need to be able to do what you want. So in order to get to that place, there are a few little tricks. There's some really fun ones. If you think the insincorator one's fun, I've got some really good stuff coming up. So um, a lot of it's to do with perception. You know, a lot of it's to do with the itty bitty shitty committee, I call them. And that's like the little voice inside your head that goes, you can't do that, or what are they worried about over there, or have you seen those people doing their thing, and they're better than you, and blah, blah, blah. You, know, you know that voice? Really annoying, hey? You've actually got like a good committee as well, but that little itty bitty shitty committee is like pretty hyperactive. And so they kick into effect when we think about what someone else is thinking. And we have what's called a perceptual position. It's quite a big word, two big words actually. And um, what that means is the way that we're seeing something in our mind means that we give it weight or it, gives, it yields power over us or it doesn't. So for example, if I was to say to you, hmm, maybe think about something that's bothering you and just think about it, let's close our eyes, I'll close my eyes too. So close your eyes for a moment and think about something that's bothering you and I just want you to bring it into your mind's eye. So it might be a situation, maybe you're riding your horse or you've had a conversation with someone and you imagine them standing in front of you and you can see them speaking to you. And now what I want you to do is I want you to change the colour of the picture so that it's no longer colour. I want you to change it to black and white. And I want you to make it really defocused so all of a sudden that person standing in front of you or that situation is like, quite fuzzy, like when your, computer, when your computer goes out of focus or if the TV was going out of focus. And now I want you to take the picture and I want you to push it really far away so it's gone from occupying your whole mind to being like the size of a jelly bean on the horizon. And then I just want you to watch it drop off the edge of the horizon till all of a sudden there's just blank space in front of you. And you can open your eyes again. Can you see what that does? It actually changes how you feel about something. Because when you're thinking about something or someone, you hold it in the front of your mind. So let's say you've had a conversation with someone and they haven't been very kind. And it's one of those on replay. 
you know, like you're thinking about it and it's on repeat dial. We all have these situations. And so you can see that you close your eyes at night, you can see them talking to you and you find that situation. So you can change how you're perceiving it by altering the colour, pushing them far away, seeing them, I've got this thing where they drop off the edge of the world, it's fantastic. So I pretend that the world is flat and I'm sitting on like a big dinner plate and that represents the world and there's me in the middle and I'll just reduce someone to the size of a belly jelly bean and then I'll shoot them out to the edge and watch them drop off. It's amazing. No one even knows you do it. And you can all laugh at me, but I bet at some point in time you do that yourself. <laughs> Basically, it's just, jokes aside, it's just changing the way you perceive something. So if you are finding you're having a conversation with someone in your head that's annoying or you're thinking about someone else, turn the volume down or put them on mute or just change their voice so they're sounding like Daffy Duck and you change the feeling that you have attached to it. Do you see what I mean? Because it's all mind games. We're just giving something a lot of meaning that doesn't need to be attached there. So in terms of being concerned about what other people think, this is what I do. I have my circle of awesome. And your circle of awesome is going to take up a one inch by one inch piece of paper. So you have to be really selective. To pick three or four or however many people you want to be on your circle of awesome, and you're gonna write those people down on the piece of paper. Now these people aren't people that just blow hot air towards you for the sake of it. They're people that you know have your best interest at heart that know where you're coming from and what you want and will give you real feedback. You know, be like, that was awesome and I think this could be something that you could do better next time. And there's value to that, you trust them. And everyone else outside of that, it doesn't mean that you don't pay attention to them, but they're not in your circle of awesome. And your circle of awesome just gives you a point of reference to go, these are the people I pay attention to. And these are the people that distract me. You know, and this is what I need to be on task with in order to get to that place. And when you define that for yourself, it again becomes a process of actively doing. So it's really easy to go, oh, she told me that, but it's not that easy. No, it's not that easy, but it's also not that easy to live with a mind that's completely out of control. So if you have to actually keep cultivating the practices that allow you to, to do the things that you want to do. Yeah. You don't have to flick people off the edge of the world if you don't want, you can do whatever you want, but... That's it. Circle of Awesome is a really good start. Because you know the people that have your best interest and know where you've been and you can trust them. Yeah? Is there anything else? Yeah. Is there any questions? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're talking about um, what other people think. Yeah. In life, sometimes there are people who you like aren't in the Circle of Awesome, but your success or, or lots of things in life depend on what they think. You know, it might be a judge in a competition, it might be a boss, it might be a spouse. Mm -hmm. it might be a child that's difficult or something like that whereby you know you kind of you don't want to live your life caring about what they think but you realize if they think badly of you it's going to affect you if your boss thinks badly of you it's going to affect you if a real boss thinks or a judge thinks badly of you it's going to affect your ability to win a competition mm -hmm. so how do you deal with that kind of conflict where there's people whose judgment you know your success to achieve what you want to achieve requires getting their judgment, mm -hmm. but you don't want to be in a situation where you're so anxious about what that person thinks. That yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, I get that. So the thing is that um, it's outside of your control and influence anyway. So you can only ever affect what is directly within your control and influence, which is how you behave and what it is you take from that situation. So say, for instance, in a competition, a result is not, it's not unimportant but it's outside of your control. The only thing you can control is you maximising your ability to produce a certain result. So if I want to get a clear round at the show jumping, and that's my goal, I then need to ask myself, what is it that I need to pay attention to in order to really give myself the best shot of getting there? And it might be, you know what, the three things I need to pay attention to is, I know that I have to take a really straight line coming into that fence. I know that I need to keep my horse in front of my leg. And I know that I have a tendency to draw my hands back, so I want to keep my hands forward moving. And so those are my three directives or the three processes that I can directly control that maximise my chances of producing that result. So that's the competition angle. The other things that you work on are a little bit more, I mean, nothing's really black and white in terms of your boss or your spouse. But generally, there are two types of conversations we have. And this is actually the discerning thing between the itty-bitty shitty committee and the rational voice, because we're not always 
completely complementary of ourselves, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be paying attention. And the, the way that I decide on what I need to pay attention to is, is there some value from this that I can take moving forward? Like, I don't have to like it, what I'm hearing, but what can I take from this that would actually allow me to affect a change or to do something differently or to learn something about myself that would allow me to approach it differently in the future? Because that's the only thing I can take from it. The other stuff tends to be other people's stuff if it is just personal. As soon as something becomes like, like your boss at work, you're just crap at that. That's a personal attack. There's no value you can take from that. There's nothing interesting you can take that would be like, okay, well, how would I do a better job? But if you were like, you know what, I really think that um, you did a great job at this in this situation, but this is a little weak, and so we need to do something to kind of like change it up in this area, then that's something that you might not like hearing, but there's a value to it. Do you know what I mean? So like you can, you can adapt it moving forward. Rules are really interesting in all of the... Uh, misunderstandings that we have with spouses or with our children or with uh, bosses, for instance, it's usually because of a rules violation. Like, you know, and I'll give you an example. My, um, my husband, had, when he was growing up, his dad used to shout at him like if he was in trouble, he would shout at him. So he has like a, uh, he really doesn't like you raising your voice, yeah? So he has an unconscious rule that raising your voice means you're being disrespectful, yeah? Now, to me, when I get animated, I raise my voice. If I'm excited or passionate about something, I talk about it like this. And so we're having a conversation, and I'll be talking like this, and he's like, Jane, calm down, there's no need for you to get like that. And that makes me wild, because I'm like, but I'm really excited about it. And he has a rule that says me talking like that means something that I'm not meaning to me. Do you see what I'm meaning? So I have a different rule that, that about that situation. So it's like these, and he's not being mean, it's just like he has a, the meaning that he's attached to that means something different. So, you know, when it comes to uh, being a good person or being successful, the only thing you can do is create a value metric that is within your control and influence. So for competition, for example, I will create a, a success rule for each competition, which means... If I'm taking my young horse, it might be if I stay completely focused and I do everything I can to allow my horse to be relaxed, this is going to be a successful competition. It doesn't matter if I come last. It doesn't matter what the actual external result is. But I'm working within a framework that allows me to control the result. If my, if my rule is I have to win every competition I go in and my coach has to approve of me, I am got, I'm setting myself up for failure. I'm setting myself up to be unhappy. Maybe my coach had a fight with his wife that morning. He's not feeling that good. He couldn't get a coffee on the way to work, so didn't, on the way to teach, because I didn't open till nine, it was eight o'clock. He's feeling it by the time he gets there. He's like, come on, Jane, pull it together. That was awful. And I'm like, oh God. You know, I use that as like a professional opinion of my self-worth. Then it's, you kind of, does that help? Yeah, yeah. We got up track, didn't we? <laughs> I have no idea what the time is, is it? Um, five to three. Five to three. Who knew I could go on for so long, eh? <laughs> any other questions? Do you have any questions? No? Where do, where do you live or where do you hang out? Are you Kiwi or Aussie or what? Ooh, complicated. Is this a, is this a loaded <laughs> question? <laughs> no. So um, I, live in, I live just outside Dunedin. Yeah, in a little place called Purukanui, and um, all of my work is online, so it's, um, yeah, I coach one-on-one -on -one on, online, and also I've got a, a membership program. Um, I'm from Australia originally, um, from the Blue Mountains, and, um, but I've lived in New Zealand. I forget I'm Australian. I'm kind of like the reverse bar lap, but perhaps that's big, big upping myself a little bit. <laughs> I don't consider myself bar lap, but, you know, the other way around. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so I've lived over here a long, a long time, yeah. But I was uh, working overseas for my 20s, so I've got a very confused accent. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you so much. I hope you've got an hour to, like, do some speed shopping before everything closes, so I won't hold you up. <laughs> Go, people. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Bronte. You're such a star.